Hey gang, this is Doug with Electronics and More. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at a faulty plasma cutter. The plasma cutter you see right here is a Lotus brand LTP 5000D. It's designed to be used with 110 volts or 220 volts AC. Maximum current output is around 50 amps. This plasma cutter, using a hot gas along with air pressure, will cut through conductive metals very cleanly up to one half of an inch thick. This particular unit was given to me by a YouTube viewer, a very nice man named Steve who lives in the Bahamas. He was using the machine and one day it quit working and it was too expensive for him to fly it back to the States, ship it to the company, have it fixed, put it back on his plane and fly it back to the Bahamas so instead he decided to give it to me and said if you can fix it, it is yours. So I just want to thank Steve for this unit. Now this unit was cleaned up. It was not as nice as you see here. The screws were all rusted out. The handle was missing. I cleaned up all the hoses, took apart the gun, make sure that was all clean. It was missing a plug on the end, so I added the 120 volt plug that you see over there. In a minute I'll show you the back of the unit. You're going to see the regulator. I took that apart, cleaned it, painted it, swapped out some parts on there along with the gauge as well as the vinyl hose supplying air to the unit. The clamp with the connector here was in very good condition, no problem there, and all these connections seem to be just fine. When you turn on the unit, normally the cooling fan would come on once that switch is turned on. The cooling fan does not come on. If I squeeze this little lever here on the switch, it does allow air pressure to flow through, 60 to 70 psi, and when I release, Within a second, it turns back off. So there is a partial loss of power to this unit. Normally with units like this, common faults would be a faulty MOSFET, a blown out diode, or a burned up resistor. I also notice when I turn this on that there's a sizzling and whining sound coming from this part of the unit right over here. Now when I take all these screws off, I'm going to show you exactly where it's coming from. If I'm lucky, it's only going to be a faulty power supply board, which I can take out of the unit, inspect, and hopefully repair. Let me take off the cover and show you the inside, but before I do that, let me show you the rear side of the unit. Okay, this is what it looks like with the cover off of the plasma cutter. Right over here is where the power comes into the unit. It goes to the on-off switch. From the on-off switch, it loops all the way back and goes to this board right over here, power supply board. Now I'm hearing a lot of the sizzling and whining noise coming from between this board and this board. If the power supply board is faulty, that's going to cause the fan right over here with the shroud not to turn on and also prevent other parts of the board to not receive power to allow the plasma cutter to work. Hopefully that's the problem I'm having here. Over here you can see all these MOSFETs lined up. It's on both sides of the unit and those MOSFETs handle the 50 amps of current going to the plasma cutter. Sometimes you could have a problem with one of these MOSFETs on either side. You have to test one at a time to find out the problem. You may have a faulty diode or a faulty resistor. Those are the three common issues with plasma cutters. Now if I had power when I turned the switch on to the cooling fan, I probably would concentrate on checking all these components right along the side, all through here, testing one at a time to make sure none of them have been shorted out. And I also would look for diodes that are not working properly, as well as burned up resistors. But because the fan is not working, I have a very strong suspicion that the power supply board is faulty, or this board down here. Let me turn on the power, place the camera very close, and you're going to hear exactly what I'm talking about coming from this area right here. Let me power on the unit and hopefully you can hear it. There's some traffic in the background, unfortunately. Here we go. Sounds like a high voltage leak, like a breakdown. And it's coming from right, I think, more on this board. So 
I'm going to turn the power off, discharge these large capacitors, and pull those two boards out to take a look at them. Right here's a better look at the two boards, that one there, this one here, and back there you can see the solenoid that turns on and off the flow of air into the nozzle. You can see on the power supply board, each one of these harnesses, there's one that was there, one that was here, each one goes to this rectifier, a bridge rectifier. You see the square one there. There's one on the opposite side as well. Each one's probably rated 25, 30 amps. This is what the other side of the unit looks like. Let's go closer to here. And that's the board I'm going to be pulling out. Now right over here, this goes to the fan. Winds all the way around. And it goes to the fan with the shroud. The board has been carefully removed. They look pretty good. I don't see any bulging on them. Let me flip it over. All right. Now, two of these capacitors are in parallel. The ones on the left towards the edge and the two in the center are also placed in parallel. Each rating is 2,200 microfarads and it's a 200 volt capacitor. Let me take a reading between this terminal and this terminal here to see if we get around 4.4 microfarad. Alright, let's change the range function. NF, okay, auto. Let's try right over here. Let's do this one first. There is a little bit of clear code on here, I noticed. That should be good. And 4.36 millifarad, which is equivalent to 4,360 microfarad. So that bank is good. Let's check the one on the left. Let's try it there. That looks good. You see it's switching through the ranges, there it goes. 4.427 millifarad, which is 4400 microfarad. So these capacitors here, they're not bulging. I don't think there's any reason to be checking the ESR on them. And the rating is right around where it should be. Now that we know the bank of capacitors is okay, I'm going to look over the entire circuit board to see if there are any components that look like they're burned or damaged. Now over here you can see a few NTCs and then inside here more than likely is a PTC and these usually only go bad if you see them burned up. If you want to learn more about these you can click on the I over here at the circle. The drop down menu will appear and you'll have a link to my video explaining how these work. The only problem with relays is the contacts can become pitted due to arcing. If that happens, the circuit will not close. I'm going to say it's less likely in this case and more likely that a switching transistor like you see over here or another transistor, which I'll give you a different view in a minute, one here, the TL220, as well as this one, one of these are probably faulty or there could be a faulty diode like this large rectifier diode right here or a burned resistor. The problem with this board, I'm going to have to test this off camera because there's such a thick layer of clear coat on everything that I just can't go probing around to show you what's happening. So I'm going to have to scrape a little bit in order to test each component. Now the optocouplers, very rarely have I seen those go. So I'm not going to be checking those out too much. And I may check the ESR of these small electrolytic capacitors. Let's flip this around, look at the other side. Now if we look right over here, you can see this resistor appears to have a little bit of heat damage to it. And right there looks like a little pit. I'm going to have to look at this under high magnification and also check this to see if the value is within the range it's supposed to be. I'll check the capacitors as well. But this one right here 
more than likely is the one that's faulty that drives this little tiny transformer at a very high frequency. Over here we have another component. I cannot make it out unless I look at it under magnification due to the clear coat. But I'll also check these capacitors even though I don't think they're the problem. If I was to make a bet, I would say it's this resistor here along with either this transistor or one of these other ones. Let me test everything out and I'll come back and report my findings. Hopefully I can get this machine up and running. Now let me explain what I did. The resistor here that was discolored was definitely discolored due to heating. So what I did is I desoldered the old resistor. I checked it on my digital meter. The value was supposed to be 100K for a two watt resistor. And when I removed it, it was around 120K. I did not have another 2 watt 100K resistor around, so what I did is I took two 1 watt 200K resistors, placed them in parallel, so I have a 100K 2 watt resistor. I tested on the board this MOSFET, this MOSFET, as well as this one here. I made sure the drain and the sources were not shorted out. When you test the MOSFET between the drain and source pins, it should act just like when you're performing a test on a diode. You should not have a short circuit between the drain and the source. If you do, the MOSFET is no good. You also want to make sure between the gate and the drain and the gate and the source that there is not a short. Once the test was completed, to be extra certain, I desoldered this one, that one, and that one. This is an IRF-Z24N MOSFET end channel. Once it was removed from the board, using my component tester, which I show in another video, I tested each one and confirmed every single one was working properly. I also tested each one of these optocouplers. There's one, two, three, four. And what I did is I checked on the LED side using the diode function on my digital meter and I got around 1.05 volts on each one of these so I know each one of these is working just fine. I checked each one of these capacitors all of these are working fine as well the small capacitors, the non-polar, I did not bother to check usually if they're ruptured or look like they're darkened from being heated I'll check them but in this case everyone looked good so I left the capacitors alone I checked the windings on the transformer to make sure none of the windings are open. I also checked each one of the NTCs, this is the inrush limiters, and I checked the PTC over here. As this one heats up, the resistance value is going to increase. As these heat up, the NTCs, the resistance value is going to drop. I also inspected and tested all the other resistors on the board, as well as every single diode. All of them are fine. The only two things remaining which could be a problem would be this integrated circuit, this 8-pin through hole, or one of the relays. Now I did look much closer at these relays and I discovered a problem. Let me give you a closer look to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Alright, if you look at this one right here, it's nice and smooth. Alright, no evidence of any heating issues. Look at this one now. What do you see over here? There's a huge bump. And that's caused to heating of the contacts. More than likely, this is my problem. I do not have this exact 24 volt relay on hand, but I do have another 24 volt relay which is capable of handling the same current. I'm going to desolder this, try my other relay. If the cooling fan comes on, I would expect everything else to work just fine. Let's give it a try. Right over here on the back side, you can see how wide the trace is and how thick the solder is because there's a lot of current going through here. And this is the other side. So between this pin and that pin on the relay, it is burned. Over here is the relay coil, that pin and that pin. Swapped out the faulty 30 amp circuit board mounted relay. And in order to swap it out, I had one that was much better than the one that was installed on the unit. Less likely that it's going to overheat like the previous one. 
what I had was this 24 volt 20 amp relay now there's two contacts in here each one is rated at 20 amps so what I did as you can see each one of these leads is paralleled up so I'll be able to use both contacts together by doing that I'll be able to carry the 30 amp load from this board this relay here is made by Potter and Brumfeld and I actually found this in a gas pump that was thrown away at the dump there was six of these in there all the contacts were in great shape I tested them so I was lucky to find these relays because they're not exactly cheap the coil resistance on these is around 660 ohms and on this one it's around 460 ohms so it does draw a little more current but it should not have any negative effect when I turn the unit on if the fan powers up then I'm going to note the board is working properly now hopefully the plasma cutter will also turn on if the plasma cutter does not turn on I'm going to have to keep looking to find out the problem there is one thing on the unit I would like to show you over here on the unit you're going to see these two wires these white ones and they're going to a thermal switch which is located right behind this rail which is screwed directly into this large heat sink if this becomes too hot then the sensor here, which is a normally open sensor, will close the circuit around 80 degrees Celsius. To test this, I removed it from the unit using the continuity setting on my digital meter. There was no continuity. It was a normally open device, so I placed it in boiling water, and I heard it click, and the meter came on. It cooled off, and it went back to normally open. I reinstalled it with new thermal compound. So that's definitely not going to be a reason why the unit is not working. Let me reinstall the board and give it a shot. Okay, I have the board reinstalled inside the plasma cutter. Over here is the relay that I used. And you're going to notice that I applied this rubber around where the terminals go. And it does fit very nicely tucked inside the unit right here. Let me pull it out because I want to show you one other thing. All right. This board over here, before I put this back in, I decided to unscrew it. On that board, and it controls the solenoid for the flow of air into the nozzle, there's a relay back there, another transformer, there's two MOSFETs and an NPN transistor, along with a couple of resistors and diodes. I decided to test out everything on that board to rule out anything on that board from being a problem as well. What I'm going to do now is tuck this back in nicely like that. And I'm going to power up the unit to see if we have power here now. Going to the fan and hopefully the plasma cutter works as well. If it doesn't work, the next thing we're going to have to do is take a look at all of these diodes. There's two, four, six here, six on the opposite side. They are 4204S, 400 volt, 20 amp rated diodes and they're very easy to test going to put the digital meter to the diode setting and what you're going to do you're going to take the probe the red one touch it right there above the ferrite bead to the center 0.35 and you're going to leave it there and go to the opposite side and you have the same and then try it backwards to make sure that there's no reading, just like an ordinary diode. Do the same here. And you're gonna do that to each and every one. So you do it there to there, 0.35, switch it around. Usually when there's a failure, you're going to notice if you unscrew this, a chunk of the semiconductor is going to be blown away or cracked. And the same goes for all these N-channel MOSFETs lined up across the top. You have six here and six on the opposite side as well. Those MOSFETs are IRFP23N50Ls. Each one is 500 volt rated, 23 amps. And the configuration is gate drain source. It's hard to see, but there's resistors lined up right over here. Each one of these resistors is on the gate. It's also very easy to test the MOSFETs. Testing the MOSFETs is fairly easy. You can leave them installed. This is the gate, and that's the drain, that's the source. You can check between the drain and the source to make sure they're not shorted. 
I'm on the diode setting. Nothing there. There you can see 0.455. And backwards it might go out of range. Nothing there. Let's try the next one. Just as long as it's not shorted, you should be good. 0.45. Go all the way down the line. When you test between the gate and the drain, or the gate and the source, you should not have a short circuit between either of those. And if you have this meter set to a higher range, you may see a reading 20K to 100K or higher. That's fine, as long as there's no shorts. You can also look at the MOSFET, just like the diodes below. If it's faulty, usually you're going to see a crack in it or a chunk that's been blown out. Now I want to show you something else. I would like to give you a closer look in here. There's a pretty cool inductor that runs right across the front here. And it looks like it's in series with the output of the plasma cutter. You have these two toroidal inductors. And up here on top, I'm going to try and put the camera facing up. You're going to see two large resistors which appear to be wire wound. Right here to see a closer look at that inductor. As well as the two toroids. Let me see if I can get a shot looking up. And there you can see the winding around it. There's one right next to it too. You can see part of it right there. Must be dissipating a lot of heat. Okay, let's power this up and see if it works. I have the air hose connected to the unit. Regulator set for 60 PSI. Let me turn it on now and see if the fan comes on. Yep, fan is running. I still have the high frequency noise coming off of that transformer on the power supply board right here. But clearly I guess it's not an issue because the fan is working now, so that's a good sign. The next thing I want to check are the two contacts on this board. Looks like two relay contacts very close together. When I squeeze the trigger right here, which should happen, it should be arcing between those two contacts. If the contacts are too close, this is not going to start up. In that case, you're going to have to spread them apart just a little bit, and then this should work just fine. Let's take a closer look right over here while I'm squeezing the trigger on the plasma cutter. Okay, if you look right behind the resistor, which is on end facing the camera, you're going to see two contacts upright. When I squeeze the trigger on the plasma gun, you should see arcing between the contacts if we are up and running again. Let's give it a try. All is looking well down here, so that means I should have a plasma cutter that's working again. Some of these units, if you go to use them and it does not start up, you have to make sure the contacts are clean. You could take a small piece of very fine sandpaper, fold it in half, like 400 or 600 grit, just clean those contacts and you want to leave a space probably of a couple of millimeters between those contacts. If you do that the plasma cutter should start working again. If the contacts are too close together the gun will not start up. Let's give it a try and see if it cuts through some metal. Okay all I have is this piece of heavy gauge steel. I'm going to run the cutter straight down the inside of this edge that's folded up and we're going to see how well it works. And as you can see Steve's plasma cutter is now back in operation. Normally you would not have the tip of the plasma cutter right against the sheet metal like that. It will wear out the tip quicker. So this is what you would have on here. And then you can hold it at a slight angle and go all the way down the line. In the beginning I had a little bit of sputtering because I didn't have the right speed as I was moving the plasma cutter. Once I got to here you notice it was nice and smooth. I have to play around with this machine. I'm not familiar with it at all. 
so I would have to play around with the current setting as well as the speed along with the air pressure. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please rate it a thumbs up, subscribe, and post links to this video on other websites and blogs. Also be sure to check out my video playlist as well. Thank you very much for watching.